Want me to kick things off? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. All right, folks, uh, welcome to the uh, continuing move webinar. We're gonna go through a bit of a basics on SSI, self sovereign identity, decentralized identity. Um, and Christina's gonna do much of this. I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the trends we're seeing. Uh, we're engaged pretty deeply with a few projects right now. We wanna make sure that we're sharing out what it is that we're learning um, so that you get an idea of what's going on out there. Uh, Christine, do you wanna take it away? Yeah, sure. So, um... Thanks for coming. We're going to go through um, a few things here. Uh, our first uh, part that I'll talk about, um, I'll go through like a real world scenario just to help people understand um, how moving from a physical to a digital wallet um, has its advantages. I'm going to do a breakdown of a couple of conspiracy theories that are floating around. Um, Daryl is going to talk about some trends and then uh, if you have any questions, we'll go through those. Um, so really our goal here today is we just want to um, explore how providing a convenient and secure way uh, for people and businesses to interact uh, online. We want to help you um, understand the benefits of adopting the digital ID system um, just to take control of your own digital world. So uh, the real world scenario uh, that we'll go through. Um, this is something that almost everybody can relate to. Um, it's gonna make it a little bit easier for you to envision how adopting the digital ID system um, can make things uh, more seamless and efficient and just allowing us to take back control of our data. So we have multiple times um, on a business trip or really any trip where um, you're gonna have to fumble through your wallet and awkwardly hand over a driver's license, credit card, or really any identity document. Um, you have to provide your name, phone number, other personal identification, uh, sorry, other identification multiple times at each point. Um, and then what about if you lost your driver's license or forgot it while you're on your trip or your bank card, your passport? I mean, it happens. With your digital ID system, uh, you only have to keep track of one thing, which is your phone, and we're all pretty good at that. Uh, you'll only need to take out your phone for your uh, biometrics uh, scan and um, verification with uh, your phone scanning. You're only sharing your information at one point via your agent, which is your wallet app, and that's uh, securely stored with blockchain technology, um, which actually makes your information inaccessible to hackers. If you're not sure how blockchain technology works, um, I've written a blog about it where I link to a really great short video, so we'll share that in our webinar summary. So um, the first part on your trip is uh, making reservations. What you'll do is you'll go to the website where you're gonna make your reservations. Um, you scan a QR code. Your agent, which is your wallet app, is gonna prompt you to establish a secure connection. You will auto log in to that account um, on your website because you'll have a, an existing account with them. You'll finish making your reservation. And when you're done, your agent is gonna um, prompt you to accept the credentials for that trip. And then it's gonna store it in your wallet. Um, and ready to go for your trip. The next step is um, going through airport security. You'll uh, just take out your phone and tap your phone on the NFC device. Your agent will prompt you to share your government ID credentials. So whether that's your driver's license, your passport uh, for international or domestic flights, your security agent is gonna verify, ver but via the biometrics, and then you're good to go. The next step is uh, boarding. Your phone will actually automatically connect to Bluetooth as you approach the gate. Um, your digital agent is then going to prompt you to share your plane reservation credential. You'll do a biometric scan. You'll compare it uh, with the reservation. And if all matches, um, you'll get a green light and you'll be able to board the plane. And then um, once you arrive at your destination, so this next step can be for a hotel check-in, um, car reservation, or if you're at a conference, you'll take out the phone, scan your QR code. Your agent is gonna prompt you to share the credentials. Uh, you'll wait for your verification and biometric scan, and then you complete the check-in. You'll be able to you know, go up to your hotel room and not have to wait in line at the reservation desk and you know, fumble around with everything. Uh, the next one is networking, which I find is pretty neat. Um, what you'll be able to do is when you know you meet someone that you want to connect with, you one of you will display the QR code on your phone. The other one will scan it. Uh, both of your agents will negotiate a private connection. 
And then each of you are prompted to share your business card or whatever credentials you want over the secure connection. And now you each uh, share a direct personal connection that's gonna last for as long as you want it. Um, and so in all of these instances, um, you have the opportunity to really revoke uh, the credential that you've shared at any point. So the whole process not only is more secure, but it saves you time, hassle, and it just makes the whole travel experience um, more seamless. Um, so the next one, I'm going to throw it over to Daryl. He'll talk about uh, a few things here. Perfect. Thanks, Christine. Yeah. So, so one of the things that we went through back in the days of the, uh, the Walt Report, and I'm not sure it made it into the uh, SSI book, <clears throat> was that part of the, the value of having these digital wallets is that these things can be piled up. And, and I just returned from a trip to the UK, and my wallet doesn't look quite like the one you're seeing there. It's not quite George Costanza level. But I do have numerous receipts and things that I need to have managed, um, ranging from, you know, the flights that I was on. I have a client project that I need to build that to. Uh, we had a large dinner. I have a different pro client project to build that to. Um, I have the old internal um, entertainment stuff that we did. And all of these things are sitting there waiting for me to process. There are certainly expense tracking softwares out there. But I'm looking forward to a day when my agent can basically say, hey, this was, I think this is for uh, client X. I think this is for client Y. I think these are the internal things you did. You need to build this and get your expense claim reimbursed. So that these agents can start to build this, can start to build up my record or take a look at my record and start to assemble them into more of an expense claim and just basically process the stuff that it already has as opposed to me having to go through pieces of paper and have to look at this. Part of that agent relationship, is, as Christine also alluded to, is I want it to handle a bunch of things. Um, for example, as I check into various hotels, each of them has different rules. Um, Citizen M, where I stayed, is a relatively lightweight. It's a European company. Strangely, it doesn't ask for any ID. It uses basically I can walk in, tap my credit card, and boom, I have a, a room key. don't have to talk to a human at all. When I walk into a Marriott, though, their whole ritual is different um, for whatever reasons. Um, they are now asking for proof of identity. So they ask for an identity document. They also ask for the credit card to just see it. They've already got it on file. And you have to ask yourself, what's the business process that's driving that? Why are they doing this? Um, and why is it so painful? Um, last thing I want to do after taking a red eye, a nine and a half hour flight, a couple hours to get from the, the airport to downtown to the hotel is come in and start fumbling through for whatever documents it is that they need. How can my agent kind of handle that? And Christine was covering off how, how that really works. Christine, do you want to take it away for the next, uh, for the yeah. interesting issue? I'll, I'll, I'll lead into this a little bit perhaps. Um, yeah. Christine's been engaging with, uh, with numerous different uh, uh, conspiracy groups that are out and looking at what are the trends as we take a look, as we do a bunch of research in various different areas here at Continuum Loop. Christine's been diving into this, you know, this conspiracy, you know, in an individual area where folks are freaking out about digital identity. They're thinking Bill Gates is, you know, is behind immunizing and sticking chips in people, but, or that the, the, the WEF is, is pushing governments to uh, take over, uh, you know, this, this deep state, whatever is WEF, which is just utterly quite asinine. But it's interesting <laughs> to see how these conspiracies anchor themselves, but they kind of fall down when you go through the what's really happening. And Christine's going to take us through a bit of that. Yeah, so um, so like Daryl said, I've been uh, kind of going down this rabbit hole. Um, I'm actually, after um, our webinar here, I'm going to do a post uh, kind of exploring it even further. So I picked out my top three that I thought people were um, kind of most freaking out about and that were easiest to break down. And I really want to be able to give some assurance to people that this is not, you know, like a world takeover trying to control you. Um, it's actually to protect us. Um, so there's been a lot of um, this misinformation circulating. And so, yeah, I'll just get into these uh, three important ones. So uh, the first one here is that the claim is that every citizen's uh, personal, financial, business, medical, uh, everything is going to be um, centralized in one system, which is actually completely not true. Digital ID is decentralized. Um, it's on the blockchain technology, and um, there's almost no data written to the ledger. Everything's going to be stored and encrypted on your phone. So 
what's actually happening right now is your personal financial medical all of that information is actually already stored in a centralized server the government issues all of those uh, credentials it's their property your driver's license is not your property and your passport is not your property uh they're they're both property the passport's property of canada and the driver's license is uh, ontario so organizations like facebook google they already hold all of your information in a centralized manner and they claim your data as their asset so when we decentralize, we take back the ownership of all of our credentials and our identity. Um, we'll be able to choose who we share it with and um, when we share it. And then we'll actually have the opportunity to monetize our identity, just like Google and Facebook already do, which is why they're not so keen on these digital identity um, frameworks. Uh, the next one here is, um, one that I find super interesting is that digital ID is going to expose all of your demons, um, it's going to follow you everywhere you go. And kind of true, but not unless you share it. So everything is, you know, encrypted securely on your phone, but you have the ability to share it with who you want, when you want. So um, it'll put you in charge of all of your sensitive inf information. The government or anyone else actually doesn't even know when you've used your ID. You'll be able to prove your identity or your age without having to show um, you know, your name, your birth date, your height, your weight. Uh, if you're at the LCBO or the beer store, you can just tap your phone on an NFC reader to prove that, yeah, you're over 19, because essentially that's all the clerk needs to know. They don't need to see all of your info. Um, it might be important as well, Christine, here to, yeah. for folks to recognize that right now, when you take a look at the world of, of, of logging with Facebook and logging with Google, um, Facebook knows exactly what you're doing. Mm -hmm. They know exactly what's happening um, as far as if I go visit a store, an online store that's not part of Facebook, but because of the cooking, um, they're actually watching my activity. They're knowing that I went to L.L. Bean and, and spent mm -hmm. a bunch of time. They're knowing that I went to a particular site and left immediately they're actually building up profiles. So this, 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 what's funny is that the folks who are cons thinking the government is conspiring to do this, it's ridiculous because mm -hmm. Facebook and Google and the other, if you actually look at many of the sites, you'll see there's about a couple hundred quiet services that are constantly watching the cookies. Even on the most private sites, there are still dozens and dozens of these that are monitoring your behavior. So this isn't a question of exposing your demons in a new way. This is actually protecting you because you're not exposing, you're only releasing what you need to. Um, and you're doing it consciously, as opposed to just browsing the internet, the amount of information that these folks know about it, about you is insane. That's one of the reasons why the government's stepping in. I think you were gonna cover that though. I might have stolen yeah. that. Well, no, it's okay. And, and, you know, like we say Facebook and Google, just because those are the most recognizable. I mean, this is every website you visit. Uh, you know, like I, I, I was looking on my um, cookies the other day and I actually had cookies from websites who said they didn't store cookies. So, you know, what's going on there. And then even that, like, they're holding all your information. Well, what if they're subject to a data breach? You have absolutely no control. Like we're leaving ourselves open to the risk of exposure every single day. Um, and then with uh, a digital ID, I think that's gonna be essential because it's gonna allow us just to take back uh, control of all of that. I'm holding my information, not Google and Facebook. Like, why are we putting them in charge of our sensitive information? They're not security companies, they're social media or, you know, they're, their organization are not security companies. Um, so when we hold our data. Christine, sorry for jumping in again. I'm gonna no, no, share, it's okay. I'm gonna share for, for just to, explanatory purposes, mm -hmm. uh, a link here that folks can follow. We'll put it in the webinar as well. Um, and I'll send it to you through Slack so we have that. That is a, is a graphic of, of what is shared when you go through PayPal. So mm -hmm. this is any site that if I pay through PayPal, all of the groups that are basically receiving data. Um, you have to consider PayPal as a payment engine. It is regulated. It is subject to privacy constraints and laws. They are, in theory, good citizens. And when I saw what information they were gathering, forget Facebook and Google who are, you know, they're not as regulated. They're not as controlled. There's not as much constraint on them. When I saw what PayPal was doing, and I'm like, oh my, oh my God, it was unbelievable. How, how much information was being shared. But folks need to realize that this is happening at unbelievable automated internet scale levels 
And what you found out is that, no, it's actually, we're starting to put the protections in place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we need to, you know, take our data away from centralized services that, that are a significant target for hackers and take back ownership. And, you know, it, we, we have to take back ownership. We've given up too much to all these organizations. You know, you put in your email, your birth date, your phone number, like all this stuff, you're just giving it away to them. Like why? We should be responsible for that. Um, I, I put my information in an app called Revoke and I've, I've been subject to over like 50 data breaches and that's only using two emails I've had over the last like 10 years. What if I put more in? Like, it's insane. We have to take back ownership. Um, so the next one here is um, a little bit the same. It's the abuse of government uh, authority in terms of surveillance and our compelled behavior, but the government is actually stepping in to help us. We are actually being abused by companies like Google and Facebook. Um, they're claiming our data as their asset. They're making money off of it. And then in their, their algorithms heavily influence us. I mean, they're, they're using our own activity and then targeting us with advertising based on it. So digital ID is all about authentication, authorization, privacy. If we have a widely adopted digital ID framework that's encrypted on our phones, we'll be able to take back control um, and monetize our own identities. So at this point, really, the Canadian government has no choice but to step in and protect us. And they're gonna work with um, and model it off frameworks already uh, in the works, like uh, in the Euro European Union framework, EIDAS, um, the, who are already uh, on the way to protecting their citizens' rights. So the Canadian government, I believe, is actually you know, taking the right steps and they're on the right track uh, with consulting um, you know, private sector companies like us. That's also you know, on the right track because hopefully we'll, try and keep them in check. Um, so it's really hard to say what the future holds for SSI, but it's just really important to remember, it's all about taking back your rights, not surrendering them. And to remember that the only ones who are benefiting off of uh, your digital ID is the issuer, the person who gave you the credential, the holder, which is you, and then the verifier, the person that you're sharing with. Um, it's really not, I don't think it's something to be scared of. I think it's something we should embrace, uh, but also we have to monitor it and make sure, you know, frameworks are being built appropriately. And I think that's on to you, Daryl. Perfect. So what I'll do right now is just run through a quick, uh, quick discussion of some of the trends that we're seeing right now. Um, if you could just jump to the next slide, I'll just up this just three or four of them. I think three like that got noted that I think were important to discuss. One of these trends is, and, and I, I realized I, I did a build here that uh, I, I would have thought I, I, for some reason, I thought I was going to be controlling. That was silly of me. Um, could you just click a few, just. Uh, so I want to cover off a couple of things. And the, the one of the trends we're seeing right now is 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 a test for a simple what some people are calling KYC. Know your customer. KYC is a, a, a very overloaded term, a very misunderstood term. Um, people are talking about you know know your customer, thinking you know that this is banking regulation level, but really when there's a lot of it. And Dave Birch goes through this. Dave Birch is uh, the I think he wrote the book Identity is the New Currency. Um, deep, deep, well respected in the payments and banking space and digital identity space. But he's really explained that, that, that there's really a couple tests that are necessary that are far more um, prevalent, meaning they're everywhere, um, than a real formal KYC. Um, for example, K banking KYC, I have gone through that process very seldom. Um, that said, I just moved across the country. I'm now living in Vancouver, British Columbia, and finally opened up a new bank account. It has been other than business, it has been 10 plus years. That's not a really good business to build on is KYC. But one of the things people are wondering about is, you know, are you a human? The question there is, are you a bot? If you click again, I click twice, actually, please. Are you a dog? This is the joke of identity on, on the internet. No one knows if you're a dog. Um, <laughs> are you a robot dog? All I want to know really is, are you human? But then there's a subtle difference. I may need to know a little bit more. Are you a unique human? Because I'm trying to protect from uh, you creating, and this my example here is 10,000 accounts and one more, one more click. And also I may want to know, have you been here before? I don't want to necessarily know who you are. 
by name, by driver's license number, by social security number, social insurance number. I just want to know you've been here because I want to help you. This is kind of analogous to, I think, the original intent or one of the original intents of cookies is simply the, can I help, you know, your experience be better later? Um, as opposed to, and again, in the, the notes uh, and that, that link I shared, you know, what has happened to cookies in the PayPal example, which is literally hundreds of different agencies that freak me out, frankly. I just want to serve you better and know that you're a customer, know that you've, you've, you've purchased from me, and I may not really need you to log in with a username and password. Um, I may not need to store your credit card number. That's a whole business decision we can go through. But really, all I'm looking for is these two things. Are you human? And or are you a unique human where I level up a little bit that after that you get into the deeper KYC, you know, what is your name? What is your first name, last name, date of birth? Are you on any uh, politically exposed persons list? Are you on any uh, block lists for uh, various different financial services um, for anti money laundering or counter terrorism financing? Um, you know, this is where you're opening up a bank account. Realistically, most of the use cases around don't hit that bar. Um, I'll just extemporaneously add, uh, I think I just did that. Don't need to, didn't need to say extemporaneously. Um, I'll add that the, the, the KYC folks, and we'll talk a little bit about DeFi and, 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 and stuff and stuff. Actually, you can jump to the next slide. I think I may actually be diving into my next trend already. This one? Uh, next one. Oh, apparently I have, I don't know what I did with the animation here. Next slide. There we go. <laughs> There you go. So DeFi, decentralized finance gets into this. Um, know your customer world. And what's kind of funny is, is uh, one of the things that Christine and, and I have been researching, largely Christine, is, is what are the DEXs doing out there? What are the decentralized exchanges doing out there with respect to KYC and identity? Are they looking for proof of human? Are they looking for proof of unique human? Or are they going deeper into full KYC? And it's kind of humorous in a sick, sad way to see the trend um, of, of DEXs that are going from the following. And they all seem to go this way in the beginning. The newer DEXs are not following the same trend, thankfully. There are DEXs, the decentralized exchanges that are bragging that they don't need to know anything about you. You can do anything you want here. We don't need any identifiable information, which is nice in some ways except these folks have absolutely no way of knowing the source of funds. They could be easily servicing uh, North Korea, who just, just stole $625 billion worth of, Ethereum, of, of ETH. They could be servicing terrorists. They could be servicing criminals. They don't know who they're servicing because they're naive enough to think that, they, that KYC, the know, know your customer and anti-monitoring laundering and basically regulation, they think it doesn't apply to them. What's actually happening in the DeFi space is slowly or maturely, the slow prior is hard. The, 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 K, the, the DEXs, the decentralized exchanges are coming to realize that KYC is an obligation that they have if they ever want to leave their home country. Um, if they wanted to land in the States in three or four years and not be, uh, well, interrogated um, by various different groups that understand that you're running this exchange. We have been monitoring the addresses that have been pushing money through this exchange, and we've identified them as people who should not be moving money. You just broke the laws of this particular country. Um, it, it, it's comical and sad to see how naive these people are. The net of it is the DEXs are either still sitting there not doing any KYC, or they're realizing we need to get in and start doing KYC and they think KYC is a credential. KYC is a process, a credential that says, here's my driver's license. Um, and I took a, I took a selfie might be sufficient to meet your compliance needs, but likely is not. Um, you can't defer KYC and your regulatory burden. Um, I, I semi jokingly um, told someone who asked me, well, do you think I need KYC? I'm like, well, if you don't follow KYC, you might get a go to jail card. So this isn't a question necessarily of just fines. It's a question of hardcore regulation with serious consequences, both financial and non-financial. And it's nice to see though, that some of the more forward-looking 
DEXs that we're seeing launch are coming in understanding that this is a requirement. They're not saying we don't need KYC because we're decentralized. They're coming in saying, hey, here's what we do. Here's what we need from you. Here's why we need it from you. And if you don't like it, hey, great, cool. Go one of the crazy wild, wild west places. Um, and then you have to wonder at some point those wild, wild west approaches, uh, what, when will they either collapse or turn into kind of a dark web, a DeFi, a, a decentralized dark web for financial transactions. So it's one of the interesting things we've been seeing is that trend that folks are waking up to the need that decentralization does not mean I don't fall under regulation. It means I'm operating in a different way. I have removed a rent seeking middleman. Um, and I'm adding value by creating decentralized capabilities. Um, and due to that, maybe perhaps my regulatory burden is a little lower, but I'm not the, the groups that are not, they're thinking they're, they're not naive enough to think that it doesn't apply to them. So that's been a very interesting trend we've been watching. Uh, can you jump the next slide, Christine? Yep. Here's another one. I talked a little bit about this in the last webinar, I think, or at least uh, been just talking about it a, a fair bit in, in, in various different uh, clients and in and, and some of our uh, pro bono engagements. Um, I was talking with one of the groups that uh, fund have been funding a lot of the development to meet their own needs. This is classic great open source approach is that you have a business problem you need to solve the business problem, but you recognize overall that everybody has the same business problem or many people have the same business problem. I was talking to a group that's been finding a lot of the efforts. I'm not going to name them here just because uh, anybody can figure it out. But there was a frustration level that that Hyperledger Aries was created. And I was involved before it was called Hyperledger Aries. I, I'm just trying to think when it was. It was three, four, perhaps even five years ago. Um, when we look at things like Akapai, I always forget what Aries credential agent Python. Maybe that's what it is. If we look at that code base. Um, we're talking serious investment in, 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 in both capability and, 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 and overall capacity to issue, hold, verify for business purposes and or uh, for consumer purposes. It's been used by um, governments to issue corporate registrations. It's been used as a mediator agent so that I can send messages back and forth. What's been interesting is, is there have been like, I can't remember how many times I heard the frustration that says, you know, no one's coming. It's just us doing the work. It's just us doing the work, just us doing the work, which is frustrating if they weren't already meeting their own business needs. The, the, the message I took was, do they not realize how valuable this is? Um, and it's a natural frustration. What's really cool is in the past few months, the community, which was largely the same group of people measured on a hand or maybe a couple hands, um, largely one hand, has now turned into a regular meeting, which has 40 to 50 people who are contributing. Um, what's interesting is, is Hyperledger Aries initially was anchored down to Hyperledger Indy. Um, it's interesting to see on the indie space that it is now being uh, uh, decomposed and refactored because there are pieces that uh, finally there's enough indie networks. There's probably a dozen governments that are working towards um, indie based uh, uh, networks, dozens and dozens more projects that are anchoring down to to indie networks, whether that be sovereign, whether they're standing up their own. But the community is growing to the point that 40, 50 people of real contributors and, 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 and active participants in the community. So they basically 10 X their community. And now we're seeing other ledgers come in. Um, we're seeing already we had, uh, uh, I think it's a trust block and orb um, out of the secure key family. That's now part of a vast. Um, we're seeing Cardano is in there. Um, why are we seeing this? The reason is, is that just as the the folks funding the a lot of the work um, and there's more funders too now there's more projects they're contributing but but what they're, they're realizing is that everybody has the same problem um, I need to be able to uh, establish a, a decentralized identifier in a private manner for myself and if I want to communicate with Christine she needs a, a private a private did as well we need to be able to exchange information both on credential basis I have to have a wallet that I can put that in I need to be able to offer a credential to Christine. That's actually a communication pipe. Then Hyperledger Aries and Hyperledger Aries Wallet and, and the overall mediator agent provide this backbone that people don't have to build anymore. 
if you have to build this, you are looking at weeks, if not months, many, many weeks. Um, largely, I would say most teams would spend uh, person months building that base infrastructure before you can do anything effective, which is whereas with Hyperledger Aries, with a competent developer, you can be sharing information in an afternoon. So we actually see a huge change there. Another trend we're seeing is more and more groups are taking a look and saying, listen, I don't understand uh, which of the pieces of W3C verifiable credentials I want to use. I, I support the concept of the standardization and I know it's going through a revision. Maybe that'll meet my needs, but in the meantime, I'm just gonna use a non-crit. People are being very practical and looking good. This has you know, been in, in use in the wild for now for five plus years. The uh, systems that have been out there, millions and millions and millions of credentials have been issued, um, been shared. Proof requests have been shared using a non-creds. So we're seeing a fair bit of activity in the non-cred space. So that's interesting to see that um, what was considered um, the, you know, the original um, SSI credential um, is now getting some legs. But it, what's really nice about it is it's not like it's going back and saying, this is all we're going to do. It's like, listen, while the W3C new version comes out and while a few other things of different crypto schemes like BBS plus shake out, we need to make forward progress. We need to get the credentials flowing and when it's ready, and another thing Hyperledger Aries is doing, it's ready to support multiple credential types. So you can use a non credit in the beginning right now. And then oh, as other standards and other requirements become clear, plug in different things. So it's neat to see these two things that have been trundling along for some time, um, to, to much frustration, suddenly get the, all that attention. It's that, just that classic overnight success story that never, ever happens overnight. I think that's about it for the trends, uh, Christine. I think mm -hmm. I, unless I have forgotten something, it is early morning here. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Uh, that's about it. So if we have any questions, um, if anybody has anything they want us to uh, expand on or in the chat. So I have one question yeah. that came out of, but it's an IIW participant and IIW is on this week in, uh, in uh, the Bay Area. Um, I'm not down there but it comes back to the non cred side. It's one of the questions that was popped up is that they wanted to answer and they're gonna watch the recording is, how do I use a non creds but support W3C, which I kind of alluded to, I was trying to explain that, but I wanna handle it uh, directly. The approach that I would that I would and am actively suggesting with various different, uh, various different projects, whether that be something where, where we're an advisor on or we're more deeply engaged, is to just adopt a non-creds as is, but use it in the way that Hyperledger Aries is, is approaching it, such that Hyperledger Aries, the Hyperledger Aries wallet, Hyperledger Aries um, uh, overall uh, implementation of DIDCOM, as well as its near alignment now with <coughs> the presentation exchange from, Decent from DIFF, is be prepared to plug in the newer formats when they're ready. Um, because the non-creds is a starting point. That's all it is, but it's a good starting point. Again, it's been used for five plus years. It has been used by, by multiple organizations of different types, whether that be financial institutions, governments, um, generic business. Um, so adopt it, but be prepared to go to the next version of a non-creds, whether that be a BBS plus compatible version of a non-creds or a brand new and, and, and W3C uh, verifiable credential version two type style of credential, um, which implies a few things. One is that you may want to consider reissuing and or as time and life cycle go through that the next version of a credential, for example, a driver's license lasts about five years, at least in, in Ontario. I have to figure that out in British Columbia now. When it's renewed, maybe it's a different format. Me as a human, as a user, I would never notice the difference. I just wouldn't. Um, proof request would work the same process. The, the flow of information would be the same. How it's stored on my device and how the crypto is signed and how it does selective disclosure and zero knowledge proofs and minimum disclosure might differ on the technical bits, but the fundamental capabilities really wouldn't change. So I would suggest doing that. 
And just to, to our attendees, if you do have any questions, we forgot to as you mentioned, just uh, fire them in either through, uh, through the chat or through but the. We, through the but we have one that came in through the Q and A. Cool. Um, the, it's uh, I guess I want you to talk about what is the trend over a uh, trust registry. Yeah, that's one that. Uh, yeah, in, in hindsight, it's a great question. I should have probably put that in. Trust registries are are to me growing in importance. Um, one of the things that uh, Christine has been doing actually has been helping on the trust registry specification at trust over IP. Um, the version one specification is the most basic. It really lists only two things. Um, is this, does it answers two questions and there is a third. Does this, is this issuer authoritative to issue this type of credential under a particular governance framework? So you could say, hey, is this a, a government issuing a driver's license type X under a particular governance framework? It also asks a question, answers the question, is this verifier authorized to request this, uh, sorry, as a verifier for this credential type under this governance framework? That really allows you to set up the most basic parts of a trust registry. But what we're starting to see is a lot of questions, a lot of realization that, that, that the next step goes a fair bit deeper um, we purposely made the version one spec, which is still in draft, um, very, very, very simple because it's one of these iceberg things. You, you dig below the surface, you realize just how big things are and how fast they get they get big, meaning big effort. But the next steps really are what credential types are part of a trust registry, um, what credential, what what proof requests, presentation requests are made of those credential types in an ecosystem, what wallets are are authorized in an ecosystem. Because what we're seeing now is people aren't asking questions about, well, how does SSI anchor down to the blockchain? It's how do I know if I can trust this issuer? How do I handle the inevitable? Um, when I was on a call recently with a government and, and, a, and a financial institution and the government person says, yeah, we're likely gonna participate in hundreds of trust registers, trust frameworks. And, and it's just like hundreds. How does a financial institution deal with hundreds, thousands? Because the government's concerned about itself. A financial institution may have you know, cross-country focus, international focus. You can quickly get to thousands of, of, of trust frameworks. Trust registries are the only answer to help you scale that way. So I'm hoping that, I'm hoping that helps. Uh, we've got another question here from Will. Um, so the promise of SSI is to own all of your data, your, um, your data self. How far are we from reaching full sovereign data ownership? I, 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 want, I want you to start on this, Christine, and I don't want it to look like a setup. <laughs> but, I, but I am curious, because one of Christine's roles here is to bring things down to a, to a more simple level. I tend to uh, uh, go a little bit too deep, too hard, too fast, but Christine has been looking at the realities of what's on the ground. So why don't you take a, take a stab at this? Yeah, I think that, um, I think we're still a, a far ways away here. I mean, specifically in Canada. Um, I know that the EU is um, a little bit farther ahead of us. Um, I think that We'll see what's going to happen in November in Ontario when they do release um, the digital ID. Uh, we'll see how that goes over. If it works as well as it does in BC, they've been using it for a few years. Um, but yeah, full sovereign data ownership, I definitely think we're still a few years off from that just because of um, the way that, you know, frameworks have to be built and regulations and um, trying to have everything, um, you know, work together. Uh, like interoperability, I I just I don't see that for a while. I don't know about you, Daryl. Yeah, I think uh, that's the the timeline is the hard part. The whole thing. Yeah. Is, yeah, and and we are a ways away from this becoming the normal pattern. Mm -hmm. um, but <clears throat> there are steps we're, we're, that are being taken right now. As you mentioned, there are numerous government initiatives uh, in Canada. There are three provinces that are working towards this. They've all announced it in. Uh, there, there, there's initiatives in the US, in, uh, there's initiatives in Africa, in the EU alone, there's Spain, Germany, Netherlands, Finland, I think the UK are all moving towards and just baby steps, but they're doing it in different ways. 
Yeah, and there's still a lot of hesitation, like we saw here in um, in Canada, Saskatchewan put a pause on their system. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, like they're, and they want to watch and see what happens in Ontario. So there's still a lot of hesitation. And I think a lot of that comes from, you know, the public, they're worried about this. Uh, there was just a petition circulated in the Ontario legislature to ban digital ID that got 21,000 signatures. So we have a lot of work to do um, in terms of, you know, educating the population, uh, earning back that trust, because a lot of the reason that people don't trust digital ID is because it's broken. The internet, we've broken trust. <laughs> so we yeah. got to build that back up. Yeah, exactly. And, and as well as there's some structures there that you really need. Um, in one of the, 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 like you said, the EU is looking at taking certain approaches, some of which um, we've been working at Trust Over IP on some responses to their efforts, and they're going a little far in some directions, particularly on wallets, um, that, that would kind of close the ecosystem down to just a handful by definition, as opposed to letting the market figure this out. But if we take a look at the, uh, and, and it, it was neat to see Saskatchewan pause an RFP. Mm -hmm. um, there can only be so many people who are blazing the trail. We don't need everybody to go down the path of, hey, we're all in on this. We believe that it's the correct path, but we, there's going to be learnings involved. There's already been major learnings involved by all of the provinces who are going down this path. <clears throat> Other places are doing different things. The UK is focused in on the NHS, the national health system, and individual credentials for the professionals who are inside the system. New Zealand went uh, full SSI on some of their COVID credentialing. Um, we're seeing in Africa, there's a Ministry of Education in one country that's doing uh, an SSI-based uh, student records um, so that the student gets to carry their own thing. So we're seeing individual pieces. What I think is important, Will, is that we're, because we're seeing in the different ways, very, very similar patterns where, hey, this is a government identity document that I have. It's a photo card, it's a driver's license, it's a health card. This is a in a, a, a professional uh, a credit a cr professional credential that says i am a doctor trained in um this particular medical field i am a i am a nurse who's capable of doing this kind of a blood extraction versus that type um we're seeing this in the students because we're all walking down different paths the patterns are emerging the number one concern and i've met, i probably say this on every webinar that i've got is we need to get far enough down this path to really understand how do we do, what are the systems behind this that's that are necessary? Backup and recovery is one. Um, yeah. that's, my, that's my nightmare. I, Christine's probably tired of hearing this. No, I actually, I find it interesting. I'm, I'm into it too. <laughs> yeah, and I've actually had Christine start working and, she, and it probably won't be out this week, but uh, working yeah. on a backup and recovery post to mm -hmm. take a different lens of, of looking at it. But I look at it this way, I need to know that it's not just a cold wallet that I have to remember the keys for, the seed for, that I have a partner who is helping me store my wallet before I'm gonna put too much stuff in it. Because there comes a point at which if I lose my wallet, if I have forgotten my keys, that I am in trouble. Right now, if I lose my wallet, it's actually literally, it's actually easier for me to get a digital credential back than it is to go to a location and get a physical one, especially with COVID. Once that gets started to figure out, well, that's going to start building the, the background system. So we need all of that stuff, Will, to happen before it's going to be literally everywhere. My hope is that we won't even notice that it just kind of happened, though. Yeah. And I think like COVID, you know, that's the one, you know, positive thing is that that really pushed us forward in terms of the digital ID and going contactless. And um, so I think that there's <laughs> progress is being made and it's getting pushed forward, but I still think we're, you know, we're ways off. Agreed. Agreed. And then this is, and thanks for your comment there, Will. We, we, it's digital identity, this decentralized identity SSI space has been all consuming. Um, Christine actually came from another one of our businesses um, and has uh, uh, been drinking and, and uh, now drinking the Kool-Aid and probably <laughs> will start to make some of the digital decentral identity uh, Kool-Aid. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it, it's also um, really important for us to make sure that we're doing the right things because the default, and this is again why I think government is appropriately stepping in. They've seen what's happened when we get this wrong. Mm -hmm. They've seen that, 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 um, certainly in Canada, certainly in the approach that we take, Canada is very privacy centric. We don't like the idea of being surveilled by government or by anyone 
The problem is we had no stopping and no no ability to slow down anyone. Oh, here's a loaded one. I'll I'll field this question. <laughs> <laughs> Um, anonymous attendee, I love that name. Um, your <laughs> thoughts on government's place in digital wallets market? <laughs> um, part part of the 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 wallet report, and then we we did an update on the webinar a few, just uh, just this year. So we have a blog post on that that we'll link to in the show notes for this. It really depends on which market you're in. We're seeing a couple of trends right now. Um, DIF, the Decentralized Identity Foundation, has had numerous um, government participants, either their direct uh, government people and or the people who are working on some government projects from all over the globe, looking at what are the requirements on a highly high assurance credential and what's going to be required. And it's looking like there's going to need to be um, kind of conformance and accreditation regimes required at some point. Um, I prefer right now myself that, that, that I like the approach that, you know, as light as possible, but it's going to be necessary. Um, I don't want to, the, the, the joke I've used over the years is uh, Bubba's wallet. Imagine Bubba's wallet is in the app store, um, has a thousand five-star reviews. Everyone says it's the easiest to use, the best way to manage your identity. It also manages crypto for you. It does all this stuff for you. It's seamless and it just works everywhere. What you don't realize is it was written by North Korea. So it's storing everything in an SSI way, but every time it looks at it, it sends information off to a nefarious or, or a state actor or a non-state actor that's doing that for nefarious reasons. So imagine that when you look at that PayPal, who gets the data that a whole bunch of folks are getting the data. We don't want that. But the EU has gone pretty hardcore on how it sees where wallets are going. Um, trust over IP. Um, there's actually a really good blog article by uh, Evernim Avast on, on some of the flaws in the approach that they're taking. They're being very heavy handed. In time, I think that's where we're going to end up is that if you want to do X, if I want to be able to travel with tapping my phone and knowing that all of this stuff is happening much along that, that very simple pathway that Christine described, there may be a bar that has set pretty high. But I think the market needs to help determine where that is, as opposed to prescriptively jumping in and saying, thou shalt do X. It's really kind of heavy handed on, on, on some aspects. Other aspects, it's absolutely fantastic. Um, we'll find, uh, Christine, the, the articles that I know Trust Over IP is pushing out or has pushed out. We'll figure out where, where that is. Put that in the show notes, as well as that Evernim of Vast article. But yeah, I think yeah, that's that a great one. The government needs to be involved in this. They need to be involved. The question is, is what is their role? Um, I don't see governments building their own wallets in the long term. In the short term, they may have to. There, there are um, issues with non-existence of interoperable wallets that don't tie you to a particular vendor. We're seeing tests in Canada, the Digital Identity Lab, a Pierre Robert and team have a test suite but it may or may not meet the full needs of government. But the government, I believe in that case, will likely governments will likely kind of show the way and then get out of the way. They'll just keep an eye on things and nudge it along. I'm hoping, hoping that helps, Will. Or anonymous attendee, sorry. Yeah, that was anonymous. <laughs> that wasn't Will. No. <laughs> All right, um, so. so I think that's it. Those are great questions. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Perfect. Well, yeah, so it, thanks. no more questions. I think, Christine, you want to close us off? I think you were just yeah. doing Thanks so much, everyone, for coming. Um, like I said, we're going to circulate uh, some uh, notes uh, on the webinar, and we'll get a blog post up with all the links that uh, we said we'd provide. But uh, thanks a lot for coming. We really appreciate it. Awesome. Thanks a ton, folks. Thank you. Bye.